Rich Mintz is the executive VP of Blue State Digital, and I really highly recommend you go to their website if you haven't already. Um, they work with clients on bringing change, um, which I think we're all interested in in deep, deep ways. Uh, and their client list ranges from, it's so fascinating, from like Vogue and Google to the Holocaust Museum um, and the two Obama campaigns. Uh, so I think he's got a lot to say. Uh, and I wanted to just welcome him and bring him up on the stage. Rich. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So let's see if I can do this in one move. Yes, I can. Ta -da. Come on. Are you saying what I say? Yes, you're saying what I'm saying. Hello. <laughs> Technology is now out of the way. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, back in Philadelphia. Um, uh, I, I appreciate, what, appreciate what you said about the range of our work. And in fact, as an indication of that, one of my colleagues was in this very room two days ago uh, because uh, we do some work uh, with the chemical industry on science and technology education, and they had an event here at this very place. And when I saw him check in on Foursquare uh, from the venue I knew I was going to be at uh, in 48 hours, I was momentarily confused, uh, but then uh, uh, I sorted it out. Um, I'm, I'm happy to be here, especially because in my working environment, I'm known as the kooky one. Uh, I have this hair, and I rode here from New York on a motorcycle, and um, in fact, my Secret Santa gift last year from one of my uh, colleagues was a unicycle. I don't know why he thought I would need a unicycle, but I'm, I'm, I am taking the challenge and learning to ride it. Uh, and uh, I'm now in a room of people where I'm sure I'm not the kookiest person. So <laughs> thank you for that. I don't have that experience very often. Um, <clears throat> we're here today uh, to talk about the fact that art matters. Uh, we care about it. Uh, people that we uh, interact with out in the community care about it. Uh, and we want to uh, be better at making a connection between ourselves and the community so that uh, art will have a powerful constituency, so that more art will get made, so that more art will be uh, enjoyed uh, and appreciated, uh, and so that we think uh, the quality of social interaction will be better a as a result. So we know that art matters. Um, our public knows that it matters. And this is important to point out from the, from the very beginning. Um, uh, we're not the only ones that take art seriously. We're just the ones that take art seriously professionally. Uh, but that doesn't mean that other people don't understand our message intuitively. They do. Uh, the problem is they're not sure what to do with that information. Um, if, especially if you work uh, in a uh, high culture, cultural institution, um, you may find that people feel uh, like there isn't a place for them uh, in the work that you do. Uh, even though you want everyone to feel at home, um, actually translating that into reality uh, is not necessarily easy. Uh, and I, you know, I, I know this. Uh, from my own work with uh, institutions like the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which on the one hand is you know, the encyclopedic museum that invites everyone to be part of it. On the other hand, is a big stone building with 100 steps leading up to the front of it. And if you were not raised to think of that as an experience that belonged to you, it's hard to pull yourself into that mode. Um, and we, we don't always do a good job of uh, making, uh, of telling the story uh, of uh, the applicability of art and culture to everyone. Uh, of the fact that they are elementary activities, uh, they are the cake, uh, not the icing on the cake. Um, so in regard to, to, to our civic leadership responsibilities, I want to put three challenges in front of us uh, as background for the conversation we're going to have in the next few minutes. First of all, 
Uh, we, as arts makers, as arts promoters, as arts institutional leaders, uh, need to own our status as a pillar of the community. That's number one. Uh, number two, uh, people understand that making art uh, and consuming art is a communal act. Um, and that makes them nervous. And we need to, we need to reassure people that that, that that is accurate and legitimate um, and has social value. And then thirdly, um, there are things that big uh, political, social, institutional campaigns can teach us uh, about how to communicate more effectively, and we should learn them. Um, I'm going to talk about some today, and I encourage you all to carry this knowledge back to your exhausted marketing departments. Uh, in many cases, I, I realize that's just you, but um, <laughs> carry it back in your brain uh, and put it to use. Um, the question I get most often uh, in groups like this is some version of, yeah, that's all very nice, uh, but I have two hours a week to worry about this. What are the five things I should do? And hopefully, in the next few minutes, I'll be able to share with you some of the five uh, things that you should do. So first, just to orient uh, us all uh, about me and the firm I work for, uh, Blue State Digital uh, is a relationship marketing firm uh, that focuses on creating change uh, for institutions uh, and in society. And we do it uh, by, by inspiring and engaging people to take actions that are measurable uh, so that the people who invest in our services can demonstrate that the money was well spent. Um, uh, some marketing firms will talk to you about how to burnish your brand, um, uh, how to uh, present yourself uh, out in the world, we will talk to you about what are the five things you want people to do. Give money, uh, get their butts in the seats, um, uh, subscribe, um, advocate for your programs, and then we will try to develop programs uh, that uh, drive people toward those specific goals. Uh, my background personally is in uh, fundraising for nonprofits, um, some political but mostly nonprofits, uh, going back about 20 years. Um, if you go back far enough, my work was in direct mail, which is kind of embarrassing as I look out at this sea of young faces. But um, direct mail, it was like e email, except it, <laughs> it was on paper, and a man brought it to your house, um, sometimes a woman. I, I guess as a starting point, um, an effective online program needs two parts. Obviously, uh, well, I guess I'll do it. I'll do it in the orientation you're looking at. Obviously, you need the, the left brain fundamentals. You need some amount of technology, obviously. If you're going to send out email, you need something to send it with. Um, you need planning, because um, I, I do agree, actually, that um, we should experiment and play. Uh, but some degree of planning is helpful so that you are not um, pouring your money down a hole. Uh, and you need some deliberateness in execution. But also, um, you need good visuals, you need authentic voices, and you need serendipity. And uh, more important than serendipity is a willingness to uh, acknowledge serendipitous things when they happen and uh, make the most of them. Um, and um, just, as a, just as a sense of range here, these are some of the clients that, that, that my firm has worked with. I work mostly with museums, universities, uh, and uh, social service providers like the YMCA and the United Way. Um, the, the program that I work most closely with uh, is the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. Um, the, I realize that museums and theater uh, are not exactly the same, but there's a lot of overlap in terms of both the sense of mission uh, and the hurdles that you have to overcome to get people to emotionally invest. So just to get this out of the way, um, we did work on the Obama campaigns uh, twice uh, in 2008 and 2012. Um, one of the founders of my firm, Joe Rosbars, was the digital director of the campaign uh, both times. Um, and uh, there's been a lot of exchange of staff between our firm and the campaign, so I know a lot of people who are directly involved. Um, What's the big secret uh, of the Obama miracle in 2008 online? The big secret is they lowered the barrier to entry. They made it easy for people to uh, opt in to begin to get involved. And they raised the level of expectation by 
uh, giving people back more than they anticipated they would get, uh, giving them a better experience, uh, staying more tightly connected, uh, giving them uh, opportunities to, uh, to talk back and then making clear that they were listening and so forth. Result of that, $500 million raised online. Now, for most of you, $500 million in individual donations is not realistic, just to be, um, just to be clear. Um, on the other hand, directionally, the tactics are the same uh, for a big institution uh, or campaign uh, or uh, in a small one. Um, what are some of those tactics? Well, here are three important ones. First of all, let everybody participate. Create multiple levels of involvement so that people who are just uh, willing to just raise their hand a little have something they can do uh, to have a good experience of involvement, which will uh, uh, um, make them uh, more inclined to participate at a higher level uh, over time. Secondly, ask people to do things constantly. Now, um, if you were on the Obama campaign email list, you may be familiar with this tactic. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it, it, I mean, it's a little controversial. Uh, on the other hand, we know, we know it works, uh, that um, even people who don't take action like seeing evidence that other people took action because that is how you build a sense of uh, a community of people who are all moving toward a common goal. And that a, a corollary of number two is number three, which is uh, keep track of who's actually taking action. And the more action people take, the more they should be asked to take, uh, because that's how you identify your um, uh, uh, crust of really engaged people, the ones that you can ask over and over and over to do things, who will never say, you're emailing me too much, or whatever. The, whatever their, their complaint. So a few other lessons from the campaign. People love access. They love the uh, sense that they're getting something not everyone has. Um, on the left, you have a video. You see a video uh, snapshot from David Pluff, um, who was the campaign manager uh, in uh, 2008. And um, in these video updates, he didn't really say anything that wasn't public information, but they felt intimate. And as a result, the, the organization got some of the bump um, of uh, insider status. Um, George Clooney um, famously offered uh, his body up to have dinner with a donor uh, in the last cycle. You probably got a 1,000 emails about it, too. Um, I didn't give money to that promotion, but a lot of people did, which is why they kept running, uh, running that over and over. Uh, timing helps. Um, uh, the, the, the best performing uh, uh, financial ask in the 2004 uh, sorry, 2008 a campaign cycle was a response to Sarah Palin's speech about community organizers, which was written on the fly after she said that in her speech. Uh, and it raised more money than any, any other single appeal in the whole campaign. So um, if you are one of the organizations where 15 people have to approve copy over a three-week period before you're allowed to put it out, uh, that is the first thing to fix. Um, <laughs> and I mean, I say that sort of jokingly, but it's actually accurate. Um, that the faster you can respond when things happen in your community that are authentically meaningful, the better. Um, and be ready uh, for, for the unexpected. Um, when you have uh, people in your community uh, who want to do unconventional things to support you, you should help them, uh, not be threatened by that. Um, this is why it, this campaign was very free with their logo. Um, they were generous in providing uh, um, things like um, uh, patterns for people who wanted to reuse uh, the brand in a healthy way, of course. Rather than shutting them down with lawyers, they said, this organic energy is part of what makes us authentic. And they encouraged that to happen uh, wherever it uh, popped up organically. So that's enough about uh, Barack Obama, nice guy. Um, I did vote for him, I confess. But um, I'd like to talk about um, some more general principles and show you some examples of good uh, campaigning from other um, uh, zones. Uh, and as background for this, remember, and one of the comments this morning uh, made a similar, similar point uh, in the warm up, engagement is a process. Uh, it's not a state. It's not a switch that you flip. It is a lived experience of people who um, uh, interact with your vision and your content. Um, and 
it's not just about the art. It's also about the sense of social experience that people have in uh, uh, participating uh, uh, with your institution. It's about the sense of surprise and delight that people have uh, in uh, uh, finding things that they didn't expect uh, in their experience with you. Uh, and so um, you can't just go out and put a, a uh, classified ad in the newspaper and say, um, uh, looking for evangelists for the XYZ theater company. Uh, you need to cultivate those people up from the bottom. Uh, and uh, that is actually a fairly mechanical process in the sense that we know that people who have taken actions uh, online are much more likely to take more actions. Um, uh, it's a, uh, a virtuous circle where uh, if you give people opportunities like this, to get loosely involved, then you give them opportunities to do things. You put opportunities in front of them to express themselves, to share a video, to talk about why they um, uh, support uh, the institution. Uh, people who take those actions, when you then come back to them with heavier action asks, like uh, we need $100 to keep the lights on, uh, they are much more likely uh, to, uh, uh, to participate. Remember that. Uh, everyone uses, and this is, this is all sort of elementary at this point, but it's worth pointing out. People use all sorts of channels to get information and to share information uh, now. And um, in, particularly, in particular online, um, we are probably two years past the point where um, the majority of people used only the web as their online um, uh, information channel. Uh, now, most people uh, who are in the demographic that are going to be responding to online communications uh, will grab whatever device is at hand, which is often going to be a phone, uh, to do whatever the thing is uh, that, that they're thinking of. And I'm sure that you have all noticed, probably just in the last year, a rise of people who will look something up on their phone that comes to mind during a performance while the performance is going on. Um, that didn't used to happen. That was considered rude as recently as two years ago, and I think it's too late now. That cow's out of the barn. Um, <laughs> it's, it's okay to go with these trends. It doesn't mean they don't love the art. It means that the art is part of a holistic experience uh, that they share uh, with the people around them and the people they're connected to uh, elsewhere. I still think it's rude to like live tweet during a play. Um, but it won't be in two years. So um, get used to it. There's nothing we can do about it. <laughs> um, narrative matters, and we all, you all and me separately, uh, make narrative for a living, but this bears repeating. Um, in our work uh, with the NAACP, uh, where we run their, their email uh, and uh, social media campaign, uh, the communications are built around a story arc uh, that lasts maybe six weeks at a time, where we're focused primarily on one issue at a time. Um, and uh, it could be something in the news. Uh, it could be a, um, a, a development related to the history or the life of the organization. Um, but the point is, people want to ride along for an experience together. And um, if, you are, if you work in theater, a lot of your life is built around um, showrun calendars, which is a good thing with regard to messaging because you've got natural uh, demarcations uh, during the course of the year that you can build messaging around. Uh, that doesn't mean the messaging has to be around um, selling tickets to the show, but you've got thematic demarcations in the year uh, that you can use uh, to, to make uh, the communications calendar feel more like a uh, series of narrative cycles. Um, and that's how you create these moments of opportunity where um, you sort of build people up to an action point. And since they've ridden along with you, when you ask them to do something, they're like, well, what the heck? I've been along all this, all this way. Um, now they want me to do the thing, so I guess I'll do the thing. Um, you you um, uh, prepare the ground, plant the seed, and then you harvest it at the top of that cycle. Um, I want to talk for a minute about moments of opportunity. 
And by moments of opportunity, I mean the uh, hooks around which you can build engagement um, for an institution, for a cause, uh, for whatever it is uh, you're trying to build a, a movement around. There are four kinds. Um, planned moments where you essentially architect uh, a moment. Um, that's what you're doing when you say we have a um, matching fund donor uh, who will double your money uh, if you give by such and such a date. That's a, that's a manufactured moment. Um, uh, or that's a, that's a planned moment. Um, created moments are moments where you uh, decide that an event is going to be, or a, a uh, milestone is going to be meaningful for your organization. Like uh, on, the, uh, on the right here, um, you have, uh, well, I guess a, a good created moment is, is in the middle. Uh, that is a dress uh, from the Alexander McQueen exhibition at the Met, uh, which they decided was going to be a linchpin of communications. It was and was very successful. Uh, emergent moments are things that take on a life of their own uh, and that you exploit as a result. Um, like on the right, that is the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation's uh, dance marathon which is an annual fundraising event they do. The biggest one, which is the one in that picture, is at Royce Hall at UCLA. Um, and they've now done it enough years that it has its own momentum separate from the momentum of the organization. And then finally, the unexpected ones. Uh, on the left, you'll see from two years ago, the Wisconsin uh, State House filling with union organizers. Um, and no one planned that. It just happened. Um, but because it happened, organizations that saw it were able to seize on it. Here's an email from a friend of mine, actually, who uh, 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 wrote this. Um, this is a fundraising letter for the Working Families Party in New York City. Um, and subject line is, send some pastrami to the cheese state. Um, they raised money to order pastrami sandwiches and have them delivered to union organizers in Madison. Um, and if you look at the lower right, uh, this is not just a gimmick. This is his email to me, uh, the guy who, who, the staffer who wrote this. He says, um, I would love to see the slides if you do any. This slide, I told him I was using this in a slide. Also, uh, look for a follow up. We had the delivery guy take photos of the sandwiches this morning. It, you want to come back around and prove that you weren't just playing. Um, because that's how you create the kind of trust that you need in the relationship to get people to believe you. Here's another emergent moment. I don't think they expected this would take off as much as it did. Uh, the Museum of, of Modern Art used uh, a version of the original social media, uh, known as paper, um, <laughs> in their galleries. Uh, to It's really paper plus thumbtacks is social media. Um, they invited people to fill out these cards that said, I went to MoMA and, with no guidance, completely open uh, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, tabula rasa, uh, and they got a wide variety of responses, including this one, uh, a little girl uh, who prompted this uh, article, World's Youngest Art Critic, Upset About MoMA's Lack of Dinosaurs. Uh, and here's her card. She wrote, saw a coat closet, trash, and two water fountains. I'm very disappointed I did not see a dinosaur. You call yourself a museum. Signed, Annabelle. Now, this, I don't know. Maybe for you, this is a public relations nightmare. But the intrepid folks at the Museum of Modern Art decided that this was an organic expression of people interacting uh, with what was at the museum. They embraced it. They talked about it and allowed it to be talked about. Uh, they didn't. Uh, they didn't show embarrassment about it. Uh, and in fact, they uh, participated in <laughs> coverage like this, which is fine. It's fine. It's, it's I mean, the, the sort of cynical way to look at this is making, uh, making lemonade out of lemons. But I, I prefer to think of it as um, taking advantage of the blessing uh, of community interaction however it rears its head. Um, there are more um, uh, solemn ways to build around uh, what you find. 
Uh, this is a page that we, uh, a, a program that we developed for the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, which we have been working with for uh, three years. Uh, we recently crossed, recently, if it's months, months back now, we crossed the million dollar mark in individual donor fundraising for the museum uh, through our email program. So uh, there is scale. Uh, in in some of these uh, programs, and, uh, these 10, 25, 50, 100 dollar donations do add up uh, over time to become a significant uh, funding and engagement stream. Uh, but they had this cache of photos of children uh, who uh, that were taken uh, upon their liberation from internment camps in 1945, and the photos were just of their faces holding up slates with their names uh, written on them, and. They didn't know what to do with him, and what we proposed is that uh, they crowdsourced the, the identification of these children through this program called rememberme.ushmm.org. And that what they did was they posted the, the, the photos with Facebook commenting uh, on pages that said, do you remember me? And uh, the most amazing thing happened. They had uh, people uh, identifying themselves uh, which is uh, what you have here. Um, uh, this fellow, uh, Steve Israeler, wrote uh, via his Facebook account, I am that, I am that person. Uh, I am now 80 years old. At the time of that picture, I was 14 years old, liberated on April 23rd in, in Bavaria near the town of Schwarzenfeld, where U.S. Army, blah, blah, blah. Um, I am the sole survivor of a family of uh, eight parents and six siblings. And you can't see it here, but just below the fold here, is a Facebook comment from someone from the museum saying, oh my god, Mr. Israel, we're so excited to meet you. Will you please contact us? Um, this is uh, the serious side of community engagement. Um, we laugh at the little girl with the dinosaurs. Um, we uh, tense up when we see this. But it's really part of the same effort, which is um, making culture a shared experience through all the media you have available, including uh, internet channels. Um, I have just a couple more shots that I want to show you. Um, just remember that uh, you don't need individuals to do a lot in order to build a good uh, engagement program. Uh, you either need a few people to do a lot or a lot of people to do a little. And in fact, the latter is better because the broader the support you have, uh, the more credibility you have in the community, um, the more credibil credibility you have with major funders. Um, major funders love to see that there's a grassroots uh, community behind something. Uh, it is a um, relief to them uh, that they are funding something that has support. Um, here's an example of a program that we developed around energy. Uh, this was like um, uh, putting a um, uh, pumping uh, mechanism on top of an oil well uh, when it, when the, uh, you know an oil strike like the, like in the Beverly Hillbillies if you're old enough to know what that is, um, the, you know Dan Savage put up this one video um, about uh, bullying uh, and um, it prompted so much uh, uh, response. I think he put it up like on a Wednesday or a Thursday, and uh, on Saturday his uh, um, producer called uh, a friend uh, who happened to be uh, someone in our company and said, help us. What do we do with this? Uh, and so this was the uh, oil pumping mechanism that we built on top of the oil well to capture that public energy. You never know when you're going to strike oil uh, like that. Uh, and um, it's OK to uh, sort of be ready for that and to take action when it does happen. Uh, and then finally, I, I wonder whether I should include this because I know Woolly Mammoth is in the room. Uh, I don't want to uh, embarrass them, but I don't mean to embarrass them. I love this campaign. Um, it, uh, do, do, you, do you guys know what this is, or should I tell the story? Yeah. I mean, they, you know, they, they essentially dared um, the social media team to raise $2,000 in a week uh, over Twitter. And uh, it, worked. And I gave. Um, I don't even live in DC, but I saw the campaign. And I know, um, at the time, I think it was Allie Houseworth, and I know them. Um, and I was like, this is, a, <clears throat> this is a good idea. I would like, yes, I would like to embarrass the development director by making him <laughs> go on stage <clears throat> wearing a iHeart social media t-shirt. And 
Um, the, I, I, I pop this in just to remind you that uh, even at small scale, the same tactics uh, can be very successful. Uh, and this, I mean, obviously, they only raised $2,000. That's, you know, that is not going to change the course of history. Uh, but I have talked about this campaign a hundred times. And probably among us, the people in this room have talked about it a thousand times. Uh, and that is the power of this kind of, uh, this kind of organizing. It, uh, it gives even the people who gave $5 to this campaign uh, an amplified voice in the conversation about art. And I like that. Um, as a final note, I just want to remind you that um, authenticity matters. Um, you know, you're, and I, I love this picture because, I mean, sure, it was staged, the guy's president of the United States, but I like, um, I like the expression on his face. Um, I, the, the boy, obviously, was not staged. I mean, he, uh, you can't stage the excitement of a little boy next to a marshmallow cannon. It's, it's, it's organic. Um, so, like, for example, if you're American University in Washington, D.C., you can do this, uh, this uh, campaign, uh, this wonk campaign that they ran uh, about two years ago. It's a little edgy. Uh, it's a little um, uh, sharp-edged. Um, if you're Harvard, you probably can't do that. Um, and in fact, to be, to be uh, uh, transparent, we learned uh, in uh, doing some work for Harvard that uh, there's a lim there was a limit to the amount of um, creativity that the donor base would tolerate uh, from the brand. Um, we actually did, we did, a f we, we did a fundraising campaign for young alumni where the, the emails were written in the voice of the John Harvard statue, and um, it didn't work. The, um, the, the, the brand required a level of solemnity that didn't appear in those messages. So they got opened, but no one took action. So um, you, know, you do need to be true to yourself, uh, whatever uh, being true to yourself is. Um, and uh, just as a closing image, remember that what this is about is helping people feel like they're part of something bigger than themselves. Um, this is an image uh, that we built for uh, the website of the United Way of Metropolitan Nashville. Um, the asterisk is actually their um, brand idea, where uh, they, their, uh, their uh, brand um, uh, sort of trademark is um, the little asterisk with the message, United Way of, of Metropolitan Nashville at work here. And they use it all over the place. They use it on door signs at the institutions they fund and so forth. I love the idea. Um, but um, it's, it's not just about us pushing out uh, social good. Uh, it's about uh, us creating a, a sense of wholeness uh, with the communities in which we operate um, by all the means at our disposal, uh, including online. So I'm going to stop there uh, and cut to uh, discussion. How did I do on time? Are we OK? All right. I'm getting a thumbs up. So if you have a question, uh, just please uh, mention your name and the theater you represent as well. Or, or a comment about your own experience, because that's just as interesting. I have a, a question that uh, I'm Corey Atkins with Cleveland Playhouse. Something that uh, I think about a lot any time thinking about um, digital, online, things like that. Our audience base, as I'm sure, is probably um, not uncommon in this room. Many of us are here because we're trying to engage younger more diverse audiences who are more digitally knowledgeable. What is the bridge between the place where you have a large percentage of your audience, your community, who um, are not as digitally invested, and how do you get to a place where this can be powerful and effective? Well, the first thing I'll say is that fortunately, that's a problem that is becoming less and less uh, urgent as time goes on. Um, I've actually I've been in this job for six years, and when I first started t giving presentations like this on this topic, uh, I had a slide that I used uh, showing my grandmother uh, belly dancing um, uh, from YouTube. It's a screenshot of a YouTube video of her belly dancing, and um, 
I, I made a joke about my grandmother being on YouTube, and it isn't funny anymore, so I had to take it out. Because, um, you know, I mean, the reality is that the people who were early adopters of technology a generation ago, um, and it's basically the same technology now, are 55 and, and, and 60. So um, I, I say that not to wave away the question, but to be reassuring. Uh, that uh, over time uh, you'll have to worry less about this. However, um, given that the average age of the su subscriber to some of your institutions is between 85 and cremated, <laughs> it's, it is, I mean, there is a reality. There's a reality. Um, the first thing I'll say is don't cancel your direct mail program. It's, it, 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 it is not, um, it, it does it, it's not a growth industry, uh, but as long as it is delivering sort of baseline returns, it's fine. It doesn't hurt anything. Um, I will, however, say don't agonize over uh, integrating the direct mail program with everything else perfectly. Um, I think uh, most people, uh, I mean, the, the level of integration that's important is you do want people who open the letter to be able to go to the website to take the action. And you want to make that pathway clear. Um, but um, you know, in terms of uh, 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 making uh, online approachable for people who are sort of on the edge, um, the, the, the simplest thing to do is make it very easy to opt in to receive something valuable. Um, you've got, I know you have um, elderly subscribers who want their catalog on paper or their monthly newsletter in the mail. That's fine. You can keep producing those as, as long as it's not cost ineffective to do it. But um, you know, think about uh, uh, monthly or um, semi-monthly uh, uh, online product too, because that's sort of a, that's like a low investment uh, way for people to dip, dip their toe in the water. And it, it's a gateway drug for uh, more substantive online online interaction. Uh, hi, I'm Heather Kitchen from Dallas Theater Center. Uh, I was an adult already when the Beverly Hillbillies happened. Good. So, I'm relieved. Uh, putting myself into the category of over 60, I'm interested in um, in knowing when too much social media is is too much. Um, we at our institution are really, really pushing to do a lot of social media, um, but I'm hearing back from people that we're trying to do too much. Since I am someone who was in almost, I was in my 40s before I got my first calculator, for God's sake. <laughs> we, we used the abacus in the old days. Yeah. Um, I hesitate to pretend I am any sort of expert on social media, although I, I tweet and Facebook and all that stuff. But uh, my concern is, how do I know when I'm pushing too hard on social media and when I should go back into my cave and listen to someone else? How do I know? I, 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 have, th I have three things that I want to say in response to that. Um, uh, the first one is, uh, don't worry about investing in the social media channels that you don't like. Um, start with the ones that you're comfortable with uh, and that feel organic and that you feel like you have time to, uh, to keep up with. And that, um, uh, th that insight actually is not mine. I borrow that from, and I cannot rem remember her name, but someone here will know her, the a woman who is or was the executive director of Arts for LA, who I saw. Uh, I don't remember. I, I saw speak at uh, the American, Amer Americans for the Arts annual meeting um, a year or so, two, two years ago, maybe. Um, so, so there's that, A. B, um, if the content feels manufactured, you're trying too hard. Um, like I, and I, I, I don't really mean to bash a company in particular, but this, this does come to mind. Um, I used to subscribe to uh, Clear Wireless, the wireless hotspot thing and their their Twitter is full of it's good for customer service but it's full of tweets like good morning it's Saturday what are you gonna do with your wireless today like that's not helpful um, <laughs> that's that doesn't give me any value for the time I spent reading that um, 
And I guess the third thing is um, if you have people inside the organization uh, that are excited about trying something in social media, uh, it, it, it's okay. If you're worried that it's too edgy, don't worry. I mean, some degree of uh, unsubscribes, unfollows is okay. Because the goal here is not to have the most follows in the world and then you win. The goal is to have followers who will do the things that you want them to do when you want them to do them. Um, in, you know, in this, in, it's, the analog to this is if you're running a public TV, uh, PBS uh, um, uh, station, um, sure, you can swell your membership by giving away DVDs, but those people are not going to renew. Um, those people are not going to give annual fund uh, gifts. Uh, those people will not be uh, mission-oriented. Uh, what you want is as many mission-oriented adherents as possible uh, without worrying about how many adherents uh, altogether. Hi, I'm Zach Berkman with People's Light and Theater. Uh, a question I have that I hope you can talk a little bit more about um, integrating sort of micro targeting of, of constituencies that you may be wanting to reach okay. online. Uh, we hear uh, last couple days a lot about how different groups, audiences need a different kind of messaging platform, system, words, style, approach, yeah. and, and the way in which, since we are of limited means, how to integrate that online in a way that, that well, remains authentic for, throughout. The, 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 the first thing to, to do is that if you're doing programming that has a um, particular appeal to a sub-constituency, it's OK to address those people by name uh, in your public communications. For example, um, we're doing a program right now, a promotional program right now, for the Frida and Diego uh, exhibit at the High Museum, which was at the um, Art Gallery of Ontario and has, has traveled to the High. And they are um, uh, openly um, addressing uh, female patrons um, because of, not just because Frida, Frida Kahlo was a woman, obviously, but because the, the um, exhibition uh, is, uh, and I, I saw it in Ontario, is, is really about the um, emotional interplay between the two of them and how it contributed to, the, to their work. And they made a judgment that um, women will be uh, uh, proportionally more, respo more responsive to that. And now, I, I realize it's kind of silly to use women as an example of a minority group because they're the majority, but, um, <laughs> But you understand what I mean. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a somewhat narrow casting from everyone. Um, I'm, I have more mixed feelings about having like a, you know, separate Twitter feed for uh, twe tweens or whatever the, you know, whatever the narrower thing is. Um, because part of the goal of art is to bring the community together. And um, especially if you have narrow resources, um, I, I, I mean, I think it actually helps for everyone to hear the narrow casted messages because it's evidence that we are all part of one community uh, and that the things that other people are doing over here are interesting to the people who live over here. Even if you're not doing them, they're evidence of the um, kaleidoscope of um, human magic or you know, whatever your image is. Hey, uh, I'm Michael Rode from Sojourn Theatre, and I wanted to first say uh, thank you. I'm really enjoying your presentation and, and finding you building some really useful bridges this morning between the conversations around marketing and audience development and authenticity and engagement. Yeah. So uh, you're giving us some really nice stuff. And I wanted to ask, you started with a slide, I think, that said art matters. Yes. You talked about how uh, people know that but don't necessarily know what to do with it. Yeah. So uh, I'm curious, I don't know if Americans for the Arts is one of your clients or not, but uh, I'm curious that if you were tasked for um, a campaign, because there are these campaigns, and I'm, I'm, I'm not certain I feel they've been very effective, both locally or nationally, I wonder what you would do if you were tasked with um, moving the value of the arts, both the assets and the experience of it, in a more uh, primary way into sort of the general cultural consciousness, how you would approach that both digitally and also through the various engagement, really person-to-person -person interactions that you've been describing? It's, it's, it's a challenge. Um, and 
to answer the direct questions, um, Americans for the Arts is not a client, but the Arts Action Fund uh, has been a client of ours in the past. Um, it, it's a challenge because for Americans, art is like sex. It's a thing that like people don't really feel comfortable talking about. And <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know why that is. It's less true in other cultures, uh, in, 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 even in other Western cultures. Um, Pardon? Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, you know, I, I, the only conversation that has successfully been had around the value of art at a national level is around arts funding and, and arts education. I guess those are the two, and they're, they're, they're tied up together. But arts, you know, the government arts funding is such a tiny, unimportant part of the conversation around the importance of art, that it's almost, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's, all, it's like a, a garden path conversation. It's not, it isn't the meat of the conversation. Um, I think if I were running a campaign, um, it would be around the everyday nature of art. Um, in, the, in the same way that, um, by analogy, we are doing a program now with the American Museum of Natural History in New York City around Teddy Roosevelt, uh, because it was his, uh, it, I guess it was, was, it, was, it, it was his 100th, uh, not his 100th birthday, um, but there was, a, th there was an anniversary that just happened, and um, they, uh, re they renewed the galleries, the Teddy Roosevelt galleries, and put a new statue in, which children can sit on the lap of uh, in the gallery, and um, they wanted to use that as an opportunity to associate the museum with uh, conservation. Um, because that was Teddy Roosevelt's big uh, drive and the museum was part of that in the early days. Um, the way that they're doing that is through a campaign where they give out a um, flat paper, slightly cartoonish Teddy Roosevelt and they encourage people to take that out in everyday nature uh, and uh, Instagram a photo of Teddy uh, having a, a, a nature experience. And everyday nature means, I mean, it's New York City. like. You know, a drainage ditch with leaves in it is everyday nature in New York City. In the, but it is, it is, though, in the same way that a child drawing with chalk on the sidewalk is art. It is. And um, that is the connection that I think you have to make to change people's minds on the issue. But I don't think there's any magical solution. I mean, you know, we, if there were, we wouldn't have to have meetings like this uh, every year to talk about how to do it. I'm Robert Swibel with Berkeley Repertory Theater. Earlier in your presentation, you suggested we replace our newsletters with stories. Our institution, like perhaps many others here, send out periodic newsletters that, we th that are filled with news and tidbits that we think are or should be of value to our constituents. Yeah. So, if, so I'm interested in hearing a little bit more about how we would transition to a story-based newsletter and what that would look like. Well, it's not, it's not necessarily either or. Um, what, the point that I'm making is that uh, trust takes time to build. And uh, the way you induce people to affiliate with you emotionally is by building uh, trust in their minds that if they do so, they will have an emotionally rewarding experience. And so one of the, one of the tactics that works uh, just we know experientially is to have people ride along while something happens. So uh, you know the 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 base case for that is a is a is a, a, a political an, an, a candidate being elected or an issue, uh, a, a pat, you know like universal health care passing or whatever, where there's an end goal and we're all fighting together uh, toward that end goal. Um, but the same thing can happen. Uh, in a in a cultural context where, for instance, um, you know, we, we, or, or even a even a commercial context, like uh, we are we do a program uh, for Ford Motor Company, um, which is at uh, I believe FordSocial.Ford.com. It's called Ford Social, and it's a it's a community where people can interact around their emotional connection to the to the master brand Ford, not Mustangs, not you know. I don't know what other Fords there are focuses, but, but uh, Ford, you know, the sort of lifelong family uh, relationship. Um, and we built a messaging arc around the D Detroit Auto Show. We sort of put a, a, a stake in the ground and said, 
uh, we're going to build toward this. And among the things we did was we recruited citizen journalists to talk about uh, Ford and their communities to compete for and to compete for an opportunity to be brought by Ford to the auto show, uh, where they had an insider experience. Um, you can do sm uh, and and the story of that competition and the trip was all documented, uh, and so people. People who watched it happen felt like they were part of it even if they were sitting at home. You can do that sort of thing on a smaller scale even in your own uh, uh, community around your own institution. Hi, I'm Sandy Harper from Cyrano Cita Company in Anchorage, Alaska. And we actually have a campaign Yay, going, time. saturating the city with these stickers and collector's buttons and one of our leadership in the arts community is a um, persona named Art Matters. Ah. He does make personal appearances. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you very much.